Hey everyone, this is Tony, Dungeon Master of D&D Raw. And before we begin, I just wanted to say, if you enjoy D&D Raw, we would love it if you would support us on Patreon to hear new exclusive content and updates before anyone else. By contributing as little as $1 per month, patrons enable us to dedicate more time to creating episodes. Our higher level patrons get access to DMs notes, outtakes from our episodes, the chance to add an item or NPC to a D&D Raw episode, and even to join our monthly patron game. We wanted to thank all of our Adventure Tier and Above patrons for their support this month. So thank you Jeremy Kleinhans, Grimfuse, Fen the Goblin, a Linux fan, Feral Joe, and a very special thanks to our producer tier patron, Gnome, for serving as a producer on this episode. To find out more about how you can join this list of outstanding people, go to patreon.com slash dndraw. If you're not able to support DND Raw on Patreon, we would love it if you leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Next week will be Rumble Squad, Episode 17. And now, Serviceable Plots, Episode 17. The paranoia is super real. With me today are the following players. Hi, I'm Bethany, and I'll be playing Belinda Walsingham, the half-elf awakened mystic. Hi, I'm Adam, and I will be playing Akiva Khonshu, the Shadar Kai Hexblade Warlock. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'll be playing Scrib Whitecliffe, the human mastermind rogue. Hi, I'm Giuseppe, and I'll be playing Valen Blackwater, an Azimar monk paladin. Last time, the party made plans to keep the ruse that Faithfulness was still active by creating a forgery of a crystal in the ruins of Silverkeep. Scriv went to see some old friends of his, while the rest of the party spoke to the Whitecliffs, and Belinda reminded Jack of a deal that was struck several months ago. Eventually, the party made their way out of Veripol and arrived at the cave that was to be the drop site for the forgery. After leaving the fake crystal there, Scriv heard a scream from the empty cave and soon discovered a hidden passage that led him just above a body that was lying in a pool of blood. I'm going to tug on my earring. Belinda, there's a person who may or may not be dead. I'm going to check it out. I might need help. All of you guys hear this. Hey, it works. Okay, I will wait right here for further information. I think you guys should not come yet since that might blow our drop. I will definitely stop mid-stride and melt back into the shrubbery. (laughs) I'm going to look around the room one more time before dropping in. Okay. So, Tony, since as Belinda, I'm not adept at climbing and things, can I assess would I be able to climb into said tunnel if I'm suddenly called into action? Or is there something I would need to do to prepare? You could climb in. Your hands can just reach where Scriv climbed up into the tunnel. Okay. So to sort of kill time in case I am being watched, I am going to take out some of my paper and do a bit of writing as if I am taking notes on something. Okay. So, Scriv, based off your vantage point, you don't really notice anything else different in the room. So, drop down. So you drop down. The cavern that you're in is actually pretty small. It's only about 15 feet wide, but it extends onward for about 30 feet before you notice that there's a small tunnel that veers off to the right and out of sight. The body in front of you, as you drop down, you can now see there is blood beneath it. Okay, I'm going to draw Hunter's Moon. The cavern glows in the soft light from your blade. Given that it's stone, can I just kind of wedge it so that it's it can stand upright and provide adequate lighting for the room? That's easy enough. So you can place it in such a way and have it so that you have at least a soft glow of the immediate area. I approach the body and would like to assess it. Is the person breathing? Are they injured? What's the deal? Roll a medicine check. Seven. You're checking it over. It is a human man, and you notice like there is a dagger that's scattered actually near his hand. He's wearing some leather armor, but you're not noticing any breathing, any rise and fall of his chest. He seems motionless. Then I will draw my sword again, and I would like to investigate the room and see if there's any entry points, exit points beyond the hole in the wall that I came in through. So there's the tunnel that does lead off to the right, away from the hole you came in through. Okay. Tug on my earring. There is a man here. I think he's dead. And there's also a tunnel. I want to go deeper, but just giving you the heads up. You are going deeper, or you want to go deeper? Well, I want to go deeper, but, I mean, this is going to probably blow our cover if I do that. Okay. Are you sure if he's dead? As sure as I can be. Do you have a mirror? Yeah. 
put it in front of a person's face. All right. I will do as the man says. I pull out the compact mirror and I mm. put it in front of his face. The mirror doesn't fog. Since he's definitely dead, you can stay out there and I'll scope out ahead. That makes me a little nervous. How long ago did you hear the scream? Pretty recently. Did you say the body's cold? Yeah. Because shouldn't be getting cold yet. I would be uh, real concerned if there was a scream very recently and you have a cold dead body. That's why I want to go into the tunnel. Okay. If you are positive that going alone into the tunnel is a good idea, I'm going to trust you. I probably suggest at least taking Belinda with you. Question to the DM. Is there any way I can sneakily get into this tunnel or is it going to be utterly blatant? I mean, you can try and slip in. It would be a stealth check. I'm going to attempt to stealthily climb into a tunnel, totally in my core skill set, Tony. Okay, roll a stealth check. It's not a nat one, but it's a total of four. So you reach up, push aside the false ceiling slightly, have your hands to it, and your boots are scraping against the wall as you pull yourself up. But you just hear lots of rocks scatter across <laughs> the ground. like this, like a cartoon. <laughs> I'm just going to wince and put my sword away and hope that nobody heard that. Guys, she's doing it. I know, Akiva, I can hear from here. I'm going to say to the earring, so based on what has happened, I think if anyone is watching, our cover might already be blown, so maybe there's no harm in you following. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Zolas is kind of good. We're all going in. Yeah. I am open to other suggestions, but does anyone have an alternate proposal? Direct approach! I mean, you still kind of look like that faithfulness lady, okay, right? Okay, so I'll just be faithfulness but sketchy. That is also an alternate plan. Faithfulness was sketchy. Is there a different form of faithfulness? That is fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I will just be a weirdly behaving faithfulness and follow Scriv, and hopefully I can be of any help. Give us regular updates in case we reach the end of the range on this thing, because yeah, I don't love being caught outside here. I don't love it either, so I will scuttle across the tunnel, Tony, and... Follow Scrib. And the whole time Blood is like, this is not what I have been paid for <laughs> in her head. I would like to help her down into the room. Okay. So as she gets to the hole that exits out into the room, Scrib, you're there to kind of help her carefully climb down. Without being too obnoxiously loud. Thank you. I'd also like to help fix the costume. No, no, I was very cautious for the costume. Just, I'm not very good at crawling through tunnels in general, so. Oh, good on you then. I thought the horns would go skew or something. Well done. Thanks. Quick look. Horns look okay. Have I mentioned that I worked a desk job for a very long time? I'm happy that you're here, though. Okay. So? So, draw my sword, make sure that it's still dark, and advance. All right. You round the corner of this tunnel that seems to continue on for about 100 feet. Question, Tony. Since we were providing regular updates, could, well, probably not Belinda, because would be better at this, but try to give them directions as to, like, how we are turning so that they could maybe follow us from the outside to maintain the range? Is that possible? If you guys are saying that you're getting close to the range, I don't know that we've tested the earrings in this capacity, but I could start entering the cave and act as a, I'm within 250 feet of you guys, and I'm within 250 feet of the outside team. Can we also do that internally? So then Belinda acts as a relay between me and the rest of the party? Planning on getting that far ahead of her? No, I mean, if we go beyond the 250-foot range for Valen. I see what you're saying. I suppose that would be doable. Tony, how much did you expect us to chain these? I mean, essentially, each of you would be talking, so we could rapid-fire it. Okay. So we can daisy-chain these, and if it gets too long, then we can make a judgment call as to whether or not we all need to commit to one path or another. That is a thousand-foot range. If it's that far, we've got issues. Akiva, has Lazarus spotted anything yet that I need to worry about, or can I get into the cave? Some animals, but no. All right, so I'm going to begin moving stealthily into the cave, assuming Belinda and Scriv tell me where exactly the hidden entrance is, and I just... I think it's pretty obvious, given how unstealthily I went into it. I'm going to go find the uh, loose scree and scuff Yeah, there's almost and... like a little cairn, like a little pile of rocks that have been left behind. Oh yeah, your perception notices it. Perfect, then I'm going to roll up. I'll at least get to the mouth of the interior tunnel, and I'll kind of trail along at the edge of their range. Okay. Go ahead and roll stealth. That's a 15. Okay. You are tucked away. So, Belinda and Scriv, as you continue on, you're still in communication with everybody, but as you are getting towards the end of this tunnel, both of you can just kind of hear, like, a sniffling and kind of a choked breath somewhere ahead of you. Is it, like, a fearful snuffling, or is it, like, Zook trying to find another set of truffles snuffling? It sounds scared. Okay. Okay, so we have someone trying to hold back sobs. That bodes well. At least it means we might have found who screamed. 
Can you... And I do the psychic finger motion. Can you broadcast it? Do you need to be able to see the person? I have to be able to see them for my mind meld. For my other, I think my general telepathy, Tony, I don't know if I have to be able to see them. You don't have to be able to see them. You just kind of need to be aware that where they are. You can kind of do an overall broadcast thing. Okay. How far away do we think the sound is from us, Tony? Nearby? It's somewhere down this tunnel, like ahead of you. Close enough that you can hear it, which means it's not too far. Can I try to send out a telepathic communication? What are you saying? Hello, we have come to help you. Both of you kind of hear like a quick intake of breath. I think it worked. I'll say, you can answer me in your head. Who are, who are you? You hear a very young voice. I'll say, we're here to help. Who are you? You're like that other one. Are you with her? No, who do you mean? She spoke in my head too. I'm going to whisper to Scriv out loud. Apparently there's someone else who can communicate telepathy who has spoken to this sobbing creature, and this feels very much like a trap, but at the same time I don't want to just leave, so I guess we will go forward. Okay. And at this point, should we just ask everybody else to follow us? I relay the situation to Valen. Valen, we have someone who appears to be afraid, who has mentioned another person with telepathy, and Belinda thinks it's a trap. I'm leaning towards agreeing with her. I'm relaying it to Akiva and Zolas. Okay. I'm up for helping someone if they need it. Yeah, same. All right, Tony, is there only one tunnel? As far as you can tell. All right, you two, there's only one tunnel. When you get to the back of the cave, you'll find the entrance, drop down into a room, watch each other's backs, catch up. I'm going to try to catch up to the forward party. I will order Lazarus to, if he can, stay within range and let us know if anybody's coming up. Lazarus, you see, kind of fly down and lands atop the cave. That'll work. Then I proceed. Okay, so they're all basically following along, Valen ahead of Kiva and Zolas, who are bringing up the rear. Perfect. Yeah, I'm going to try to start doubling my pace to get to you guys. Which you have no problem hopping up and in through the tunnel, which is a little tight squeeze, but... All right, so the last thing is uh, I just paused to relay what I heard from the sad voice. I'm going to say, did this person hurt you in some way? No. That stupid dragonborn, though. Are you the one who screamed? Yes. There's a dead person here. They killed him in front of me. Who killed him? The dragonborn? Yes. With his thing. His creature. I don't know what it is. And they went past you in this tunnel and you hid? Well, they went past me, but I can't really hide. I guess we are coming to you then. So out of character, this give Valen time to catch up with us? Yeah. Since Valen is very quick, he actually has enough time he can get to you. By this point, Akiva and Zolas are clambering through the tunnel and kind of like starting to come out. Okay, I give a quick debrief that there is a dragonborn with some sort of strange creature that killed that body. You saw who this sobbing creature is trying to hide from but cannot hide for some reason. We are going to help. And any illusion of stealth is just gone at this point. So I'm going to light up Hunter's Moon at this point so we have a clear line of sight. Okay. Well, if there's something dangerous, do you mind if I take point? I'd rather be taking things from ambush than you guys. Sure. All right. Tunnel is a little bit bigger than the tiny one you crawled through, but you're able to squeeze past. So it's Valen, Valen front. I assume me. If we're going to go with uh, any sort of protect the squishy approach, it should be Valen Belinda. It's a squishy squiv. sandwich, and I am the filling, I believe, in this sandwich. <laughs> And Akiva? And Zolas? Well, Akiva's coming up behind you with Zolas. All right. So, you guys proceed down the tunnel and arrive at a much larger cavern than the one you had initially entered into. This room, as you walk in, you see scorch marks across the walls, across these damaged tables, these chairs. You see several chairs, like, kind of tossed against one wall, uh, some broken, some still partially intact. You see one table. This actually seems to be still pretty sturdy and, and, and intact, actually. You don't see scorch marks on this one, but you do see a body lying on the ground beside it, pool of blood that looks much fresher than the one in the hallway. I'll give it a cursory check. Dead? Not moving. You don't see any intake of breath there. Looking around, you see what looks to be a broken cage, like pressed up against one wall, but open. Next to the cage, however, you do see this metal bar strapped to the wall with chains that dangle down towards a pretty young human woman with short braided blonde hair. She's about five feet and her arms and wrists are chained to this wall, which from this distance you can actually see like old wounds around her wrist. Thieves tools approaching. Uh, hold on. I would like to switch to my precognition focus, Tony. <laughs> Okay. Does she appear to have been sobbing? You see her face is wet. Okay. Yes. Still going forward. Thieves tools. 
I'm going to go with him, and as he's Thieves Tooling, I'm just going to real quick Divine Sense, just so we don't get fooled again. Okay, you do get a, a sense of undead, but not a direction. So, I'll just... Okay, we've got undead around. I suppose that makes sense. As you approach her, she initially just, like, kind of presses really hard up against the wall. No, I'm saying, no, I'm the one you spoke with, you know, through your head. She calms down and doesn't seem to be trying to pull away anymore. Okay, there you go. I, I am slowly behind Scriv, but I assume Scriv ran up, so I was just speaking from across the room <laughs> since we had not spoken to her yet. <laughs> you do notice now that you're closer and actually in the room, like there's about two or three other tables in the room all have scorch marks other than the, the central one. On the central one, though, you can see what appears to be dried blood of varying shades of red, some darker than others. I am going to go look at the dead body since you guys are, are handling her. I will actually assist with that. Yeah, because it would have given you guys time to catch up. Solus and Akiva, right? Yeah. Yeah, because I was mostly just looking around, making sure nobody was like coming out of any side. Are there any side paths? Initial inspection? Nope. Okay. But you guys are doing specific things. So, Scriv, you're coming up and unlocking the chains? Yeah, and while I work on the locks, just asking, can you give us any heads up as to what's going on? I'm very confused. So roll a thieves tools check. Belinda, you're inspecting the body? Yes. What are you trying to determine from it real quick? Well, if it's definitely dead and how it died, if it is dead. Medicine check. Okay. I will assist. Valen, are you doing anything additional? I'll let Scriv focus on getting her chains undone and I'll try to talk to her. Okay. So, Scriv, what was the result of the thieves' tools check? 20. Okay. You're going in and you are able to very easily unlock the chain. The first one, as her hand kind of falls, you notice she seems exhausted. You can tell from a, a quick glance, she's been here for a while. As you're working on another one, she's kind of staring at you a little bit like untrusting, but not really sure what to do. And she's like, we were brought here, told we were going to get work. And she kind of shudders and stares at the table. They experimented on the others. I was, I, I was supposed to be next and they were making that thing. But then, then they killed the other people here. Okay. Who's the they that killed everyone else? Dragonborn. What's your name? Where are you from? Ellen. Ellen Chaucer. I'm from Halloran River, north of Orenthal. How does her wrist look? It looks like she's had these chains on for quite a while and they've been removed and attached and just that idea of the metal scraping against her skin a lot. Does she need medical attention now or? She doesn't look like she is terribly wounded, just that she might need some serious rest and some time to recover. She needs some R&R. There's still a lot of questions about who's killing what here. He's still here. Which direction, Ellen? She points towards the cage. It's a secret passage. There's another one, and she points to the wall near where the body is, and his thing is there and she's just seemingly pointing to a stone wall but i'm going to quickly go to the medicine check from belinda it's at 18 so he is dead he has died pretty recently from what you can tell the wound itself he was punctured by something but there are blackened veins around the wound like necrotic energy yeah he was punctured by something necrotic that sounds really promising okay would you happen to have seen what killed this guy, there seems to be some sort of necrotic damage done to him. That thing. Okay, so everybody, it seems they're messing with undead. If it's okay with everybody, I would like to take care of the body so there's no chance of reanimation. Ellen, do you want to go with Zolus? And I'm going to say it tell back to Akiva, she might not want to see this if it's someone she knew. Zolus. Yeah. Can you take Ellen here, back to the first room of the cave? I think that's a pretty defensible position. Yeah, I can do that. Ellen, is that what you want? I want to go home. Just at least out of here. We're on our way towards Orenthal, which means we can get you a good way home. But first, we need to make sure that these things aren't going to be coming after us. This is my friend Zolus. He does a slight bow and just says, I can take care of you, Ella. Before she goes, I'm going to place my arms kind of around her hands, and I will use my healing hands to hopefully just make her wrist feel a little bit better and so calm her down a little bit so she knows something good's happening. Okay. Tony, can I send a telepathic message to Ellen? Just Ellen? Okay. We will get you home safe, and they will pay for what they've done. You see her, like, flinch slightly, but she just kind of responds, Thank you. If you can get that stupid press ganger that caught me, too. What do you know? I don't know a lot. I don't really have much of a home. 
So it was around finding people like me who don't really have a place to go. Yeah, I understand. I know a place where you can go. Tony, do I know anything about any sort of illegal operations of this kind? Roll a history check. It's a natural 20 plus 5. You know there's not a specific group name, but you know of a particular press gang that used to run routes along the coast of Amaran, but he left at some point and began running routes along the rivers north of Orenthal. His name is Branham. We'll follow up on that later after we deal with the immediate crisis. He's a dwarf, by the way. Branham Torun. So she heads towards Zolus and kind of like, again, she's overall, she looks still like she doesn't fully trust you guys, but it might just be more from how long she's been here and just being overall terrified. And we just showed up like five minutes ago. So, you know. Right after like this guy apparently got killed in front of her. Before we go our separate ways, I'm going to take out a ration pack and share it with her. She inhales it. And I'll give her my my lucky leftovers. So Scriv hands over this spiced loaf that he has. So she takes the loaf and seems to savor this a little bit more. Oh. But she starts to go ahead of Zolus as he is following her back down the tunnel. Both weapons kind of at the ready. Once she's out of the room, I'll kneel down really quickly in front of the body, say a quick prayer to Neslum to guide the soul and allow them safe passage, and then I will take care of it. All right, and in a swift motion, Akiva takes the head off and knows that there's no chance of this coming back as a zombie. Excellent. I'll inspect the cage first, verify if there is a secret passage. Okay. Walking over since she pointed it out to you with your passive, you do notice that the metal bottom as you kind of start to step onto it is a slightly hollow sound okay is there any readily apparent mechanism nothing readily apparent okay and then i'll go and investigate the wall that she pointed out again since uh, she pointed out you do notice what looks like a bloody palm partially on the wall as if someone had been like holding it there but you only notice the palm and the blood seems to extend straight into the wall itself it seems like someone might have pulled this fake wall shut and their bloodied hand, like wherever the rest of the imprint of the hand would be, is on the other side of the wall or in the wall. Okay. I think that the cage is a trapdoor. It probably leads either into a storeroom or it's just an ambush location. I say we go for the wall. I agree. Okay. Scriv, can you figure out how to get that wall open? Oh yeah, no worries. Quick general inspection of the wall. You do see that it is, you can push it open. So I'll point out the mechanism, let Valen take point. So you are able to shove the wall open. It has a slight grinding sound to it as it is pushed open. As it does, you see that it actually is a full handprint on the interior side, kind of where the door of this fake wall is, of the bloody hand that seems like he was trying to pull this shut. As you do, you see a small tunnel that curves downward. Is this all new construction? Is it old? Is it natural and they just kind of moved in? And they installed some walls to make it more homey? A lot of the walls themselves look like they were just already here. And it seems like they took advantage of what was already here. Like it was a mining operation from the past? Yeah. Okay. So you proceed down this tunnel? Yep. Okay. As you begin to head down, you start to spot this chamber ahead of you. What appears to be some sort of spherical room. And heading down... You hear the sounds of metal scraping on metal. Like machinery. Sounds like moving armor. Ah. Joy. And as you are arriving at the the base of this incline down, you see within this 40-foot spherical room, three dead bodies across the floor. Huddled against the far wall, though, appears to be a figure dressed in heavy metal armor, but clearly something unnatural about it, as black smoke seems to rise between the seams in the armor. And as you enter into the room, a pair of glowing eyes beneath this helm turn to face you. I need you all to roll initiative. So this thing turns and you see this uh, large uh, spike kind of at the end of its armored gauntlet as it starts to run at all of you. Valen, what would you like to do? So it's big and it's charging at everyone and... That doesn't leave me a whole bunch of options, except to get in its way. I'm um, pretty sure Divine Favor is a bonus action, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to get all up in his grill. I'm just going to uh, stay on my ground and try to duke it out with him, hope he doesn't run me straight over. Okay. That is a 22 to hit. 
22 hits. So, Valen, as this divine energy washes over you, focusing into your fists, you run around and go head to head with this thing as a fist comes up. 11 damage, three of which is radiant. So the first fist comes in, slams into the collar piece of this metal suit. And as you hit, you kind of hear a hollow sound ring throughout as a pulse of divine energy echoes through it. It recoils slightly from the hit. Hmm. All right. Good to know. So just going to hunker down and that's my turn. Okay. That brings us to Akiva. I'm going to saddle up to this one pillar right over in front of it. Okay. And then I'm going to just go ahead and sling a Eldritch Blast at it. All right. So make your attack roll. That's a 24. That'll hit. So, Akiva, you sidle over to one of the, the four pillars that dot the area and kind of hunker next to it as you release a eldritch blast of energy towards this creature. Seven force damage. Okay. And then I think that's all I'm going to do for now. All right. So, Valen, as you had hit it right in its collar, a blast of energy just slams into its right shoulder, kind of knocking it slightly off balance as some of the armor there gets slightly dented. Now it's its turn. So it brings up its fist and goes to swing the one with the sharpened point on it. It's going two swings against you, by the way. Oh. First one swings and you duck out of the way, easily missing it. But it comes around with surprising speed as its spike tip jabs into your side on a backhand swing. I need you to make a constitution saving throw. You're hardy, right? Oh, I am. That's a 21. Okay, so you save. Okay, so you take... 12 points of piercing damage, <laughs> and 3 points reduced to 1 of necrotic damage. As the blade punctures, you feel some of your life force attempt to be pulled away from you. You push and resist whatever this effect is. Nope, do not like. Scriv, you're up. I'm concerned, given the body that we saw earlier, if these have the same signs, and then I would call for Akiva to... Well, I guess I would take care of them in that case. Make sure they don't rise and give us more trouble to deal with. Cursory look, you're trying to determine if they have those wounds? Yes. Getting close? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to use my bonus action to call out the creatures, the way it's holding itself, its balance, and mm -hmm. give Valen advantage on his next strike. Okay. Just like it's putting more weight on its left foot, kick it from the right, and then I would like to spend an action to just, I guess, cut off the arms from the zombie. The arms? Yeah because then it can't crawl towards me. <laughs> Make an attack roll with advantage. 20. Okay. With swift motion, the arms are removed. All right, cool. I'll probably just wind up doing that to the rest of them. Belinda. Okay, I'm going to spend two points to use Assess Foe, and I want to know its current hit point total and its resistances. Its current hit point total is 117. Cool. It is resistant to acid, cold, fire, and lightning. I'm quickly going to telepathically share that with Valen since he is right there. Okay. Then I'm going to move up to this nearest pillar. The one across from Akiva, basically. Yes, but I would like to try to use the, the pillar as cover as much as possible. Okay. And I will use my mind thrust ability for now. That's a two. That does not meet my DC. Nope. So roll your damage. That's four points of damage. Okay. So you initially are sensing its aura of this creature. You discover its vitality and, and things that it seems to be resistant to as you move up to the pillar in front of you across from Akiva and kind of hunker behind it as you focus your psionic energy and it recoils from your mental attack on it. All right. And then I will shift so I can see it, but I am behind the pillar as much as possible. Yeah, no problem. So you have partial cover there. Thank you. Valen, you're up. You just saw it recoil from an unseen force. For right now, I'm just gonna play it cool and uh, keep just pummeling it. So you'd still have divine favor. Actually, concentration. Well, I rolled an 11. That's really good. Cool. Then you're good. So you maintain concentration on your divine favor. All right. That's an 18 on the die. That'll definitely do it. I will flurry a blows. All right. I believe this is the first time you've used this. Yes. As you tap into your key and release two other strikes. 16. Ooh, the last one's a crit. Yay! Nice. nice. All of that hits. 28 damage. So that is your regular attack, your two unarmed strikes, and three divine favors with your crit damage, correct? Yes. All right. So, Valen, as you focus your energy and allow the key to flow through you, you strike it in the stomach, spin, slam a leg into its side, turn again, and shove a knee into its chest as it kind of stumbles back. And you just feel the armor dent after each blow. 
You guys have never seen Valen move that quick in a... Just gonna stop and rub my knee after that last hit. Yeah. As you just see him pummel this thing, small bursts of radiant energy with each strike. Akiva. I'm gonna do something new. <gasps> All right. What? I'm going to just point at that big hulking thing, and then I'm gonna cast Toll of the Dead. Okay. So it's gotta make a wisdom saving throw. If it doesn't make a 15 DC spell save, it'll take 1d8 of necrotic damage unless they're missing any hit points, which they instead take 1d12. Okay. Valen, from that close, you kind of hear this almost creepy come from the creature, like it's surrounding it. It is unaffected. Darn it. Bonus action or movement? I'm good. I'm staying right here. All right. So you release your spell and then tuck back around the pillar and hold. It is its turn. So it's going to circle around you, Valen. Oh, no. I don't like that. Me either. And you hear this kind of noise come from inside it, like this grinding sound that rapidly increases, and suddenly like part of its body explodes and shoots out, spraying shards everywhere in the five foot radius. I need Valen, Akiva, Belinda to roll dexterity saving throws. Akiva and Belinda, you both have partial cover, so you get a plus two bonus to it. 13. 16. 15. As the shards shoot out everywhere, you see like it actually seems to slow slightly immediately after, but these shards come out. Valen, you instinctively duck and try to avoid most of these shards. Akiva, Belinda, you start to duck and roll around the pillars. Each of you takes three points of piercing damage. But that is its turn. Scriff. Move over here. Okay, moving around to the next body at the far corner of the room. Yeah, how's this body looking? Also punctured, also crushed. There haven't been any motions from these two bodies. They have not moved. The paranoia is real. <laughs> yes. The paranoia is super real. However, this thing just exploded. Is there a vulnerability now that it's burst part of its armor off? No, but it looks like it's moving a little slower. Okay, I'm going to draw my bow, and I'm going to pelt it with some arrows. All right. 18. That is 14 damage. All right. And I'm going to call out, Akiva, it's weak in the left knee. So, as Scriv, you run around the pillar opposite your allies, come around the corner, drop your hunter's moon, draw your bow, and fire an arrow that pierces through its left shoulder and does some serious damage to it as you call out that the left knee is weak to Akiva, giving him a opening on his next attack. Blinda. Okay, I am going to use my precognitive hunch ability that lets me add a d4 just in case there are any more saving throws. Just on the off chance as a bonus action. And then for my action, I am going to go with my classic Hammer of Inquisition for three points. Okay, ten total. So nope. Nineteen points of damage. So, Belinda, as you channel your psionic powers, you catch small glimpses into the immediate future, giving you a sense of danger that might come your way. As you do, you then force your powers towards this armored entity. As you hear almost a clang coming from within its its helm as it just takes a couple steps back and re recoiling from some sort of invisible strike. That is all. I will stay where I am for now because if I move any further into cover, I will not have a line of sight on my party members. So I will crouch in place <laughs> as much as possible and make myself very small behind my pillar. Okay. Valen, you are up. So far, the strategy of punching it seems to be working fairly well, but that being said, I'll just take a quick step over here so I can mm -hmm. benefit from flanking. Thanks, Akiva. Yeah. <laughs> Does it still have an arrow sticking out of it? In its shoulder, yeah. Because I want to punch that arrow right through it. Go for it. 16. Hits. Next one is 21. Hits. And 23. So Flurry blows again? Yes. Okay, so all hits. Okay, nice. 27 points of damage. Oof. So again, Valen, you feel the key and you course through your body as you first send a punch that shatters the back end of the arrow as you shove it deeper into the creature and slam your fist into its shoulder as the armor cracks away. You come up with your leg and just crack into its ribs as you come around with a backhand across the back of its helm and again the armor is cracking and denting and as it does you see a lot of this black smoke start to kind of seep out more rapidly it seems like it's it's having a rough time holding itself together now akiva you're up i'm going to take my kopesh and i'm going to cast branding smite <gasps> did he do it the first die i picked up was a one <laughs> And the next one was a 20. So that is a solid 37. Jeez, man. So Akiva. Yeah. 
How do you want to do this? <gasps> oh, no way. I knew we were getting close. Okay, so I know it's radiant damage. Can it be like weird shadowy astral light and it just kind of infects it, like into the wound and then just kind of bursts? Okay. So, Akiva, you draw your kopesh and focus this new spell that you have, this branding smite, as your onyx blade doesn't glow with light, but it seems to increase in this dark energy that encompasses it. As you swing, everyone else sees your eyes glow red as it hits the weak left knee that Scriv points out, and the armor seems to almost disintegrate from the strike as you continue to bring your arm up, slamming into its abdomen, and continue to swing at an arc at a diagonal across its form, and it's chest plate just shatters from a pulse of this black energy and this thing just collapses to the ground and there's a brief moment all of you see just akiva glowing red eyes and you think for a second his hair turned black but he is back to normal what say what huh belinda you have seen that image before akiva yeah are you okay yeah i'm good so you are out of initiative oh okay i thought i saw something. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Because I didn't notice this at all, didn't I? No. I would like to investigate the- The creature? Yeah. You're inspecting the body or you're trying to figure out what it is? I want to find out what this thing is. That's an arcana check. If you're trying to inspect the body, that's an investigation check. I know nothing about magic, so I guess I'm investigating the body. Okay. So while they're doing that, I will kind of go over to the bodies and be like, Screw, we actually had a good idea. I will go inspect them, and if there's any chance, I will take care of it. Okay, so you are taking the heads off of the remaining two bodies. 22. 22 investigation, and Belinda, I saw you had a... 21 arcana. Okay. Uh, Valen, what are you doing while they're checking this really quick? If they're looking through the bodies, real quick at a glance, none of them's a dragonborn, is it? Nope. They're all human. Yep. Okay. They're all wearing common clothes, not you know, torn or ripped, so they definitely don't, in the sense of, they don't look... Homeless? Like they were. No, these don't seem like these were the experiments. Okay, so we still have to deal with the Dragonborn. So we'll jump to that in just a moment. Scriv, your investigation check of a 22. Yes. So this thing has all sorts of, you see, gears and mechanics inside it. It has a small blue jasper in its center, but because the, the chess piece is completely obliterated, it's kind of like fallen to the ground. And it seems like it definitely had a spot in it as if it was used as sort of a central power source. But the gem is cracked and damaged. But yeah, you see all sorts of gears and tubing and pipes. It's definitely a very mechanical creature that seems to have been had a little bit of arcane help in addition to it. Huh. Okay. Belinda, based off your arcana check, you have heard of experiments like this. Based off of your understanding of constructs, this is a Felforged. They are essentially a spirit that has been bound into a construct body, but not in the same way that most constructs are formed. Most constructs are formed from an elemental spirit. This is a mortal spirit, so it takes on an undead presence. So someone's soul was bound to this construct to animate it and give it power. Yes, and usually in that process, the spirit kind of goes insane and becomes enraged. Makes sense. Do I know what happens to the spirit when the construct is destroyed? Essentially, it passes on to the afterlife. Oh, well, that's kind of an upside. I will share that with the group that we have freed whoever this was to pass on. Huh. Which I suppose is a small blessing in this circumstance. I would like to take the small crack gem. Okay. As you guys are doing this, you see the room, like I said, is about 40 feet in every direction, including up the far wall from you, about 25 feet off the ground, vanishes. As you are staring into another room and a white dragonborn in dark robes is pointing a cylindrical metal object at all of you. Directly behind him, you see a blue skinned woman. What is happening? <laughs> the wall disappears and there's it looks like it was an illusory wall. Oh, cool. They were there the whole time just watching us fight like that. Behind him, yeah, you see an older woman, pretty tall, black, bluish green skin and a bald head wearing plain clothes, but you don't see her wielding anything. So the dragonborn is a white scale dragonborn. You see the, the dark robes and he has a kind of a crested head and bright blue eyes, older looking. And as he's pointing this weapon at you, you see the bluish green skinned woman behind him just kind of looking around 
at all of you cautiously. Uh, you do see at her side is a short sword and what looks to be a similar cylindrical object. Belinda, you recognize it as a gun. As he's just, who are all of you? If you are interested in talking, I prefer you not point that in our direction. You come into my place. I want to know why you are interfering with my experiment. Do I know you? Staying real close at you, Belinda. Not to my knowledge. I'm interested in knowing more about your operation. I'm always looking for work with my associates here. Perhaps we got off on the wrong foot. He looks over at the woman beside him. Esvel, can you read anything off of them? She starts to stare at all of you and just focus. Uh, I'll switch my focus, Tony. <laughs> Sorry. What are you switching to? Switch it back. <laughs> switch it to, to all, your aura sight focus? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> She pauses and has a almost a double take on you, Belinda. And you hear in your head, did she send you? And that is where we're going to leave this episode for today. Thank you all for listening. Please share this with your friends and follow us on Twitter at Rules is Written. Or you can check out our website at dndraw.com. Feel free to email any questions to our Dungeon Master at dm at dndraw.com. Also subscribe and leave us a comment or review anywhere podcasts are found. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash dndraw. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.